for you or maybe your morning's over but i hope you had a good one uh welcome to the reading group i can't figure out how to get this side bar to go away um so that's where i am right now actually i might be able to to just deal with it a different way uh so today we are going to be reading this paper on the dangers of sarcastic uh, parrots no that's it's on top of other stuff all right here we go um uh, yeah 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 <laughs> nope it's still on top of other stuff well i guess We'll do it like this, and I'll just have the paper outline that I can't figure out how to get rid of behind me. Uh, and yeah, that's how we'll handle it. Uh, so this paper is uh, to appear in um, FACCT. Uh, it's an ACM conference on uh, fairness, accountability. The I think the second C is the two C's are also for accountability and transparency, um, which will be happening. Actually, when is that happening? Da, 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 da. March 3rd to 10th, 2021. And here is whoop, the, uh, information about it. So it'll be, uh, in March, uh, where the paper is to appear, but it is a peer-reviewed conference, so this paper has undergone peer review, which I know some of the other papers that we have read haven't. Uh, so, let's hop into it. <laughs> I'll make this, make this bigger again. Again, I cannot figure out how to get rid of this little thing. This just turns it into that instead. And I can't like drag it to get rid of it. So we're handling it as best we can uh, in this uh, a year of trials. Uh, and the paper is by uh, co-first co authors, Emily Bender and Tim Nickabru, and then uh, Angelina McMillan Major, and uh, also the fourth author. Uh, and Emily and Angelina are from um, the University of Washington and uh, Timnit is with Black and AI and was previously at uh, Google on their AI ethics team. And if you're unfamiliar with the the whole situation, um, she no longer works there. And uh, her authorship on this paper that was peer reviewed and accepted is a part of the reason why. So let's read it. Abstract. Zoom, 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 zoom. Make sure this is readable for everybody. All right, let's hop in. Uh, the past three, oh, I didn't actually read the title. On the danger of stochastic parrots, can language models be too big? Parrot emoji, the parrot emoji is part of the title. I can't get it on the video because uh, my font pack won't render it and it was just a little tofu block, but it is part of the title. The past three were, were years of work in NLP have been characterized by the development uh, de and deployment of ever larger language models, especially for English. BERT, its variants, GBT2-3, and others, most recently Switch C. Oh, I wonder that. I wonder if that was the, the big Google one that just came out that had, like, I want to say, like, a lot of parameters. <laughs> uh, have pushed the boundaries of the possible both through architectural innovations and through sheer size. Using these pre-trained models and the methodology of fine-tuning them for specific tasks, researchers have extended the state of the art on a wide array of tasks as measured by leaderboards on specific benchmarks for English. Uh, hello, hot potato. In this paper, we take a step back and ask, how big is too big? What are the possible risks associated with this technology and what paths are available for mitigating those risks? We provide recommendations, including weighing the environmental and financial costs first, investing resources into curating and carefully documenting data sets rather than ingesting everything on the web, uh, carrying out pre-development exercises, evaluating how the planned approach fits into research and development goals, and supports, uh, let me reread that sentence, carrying out pre-development exercises, evaluating how the planned approach fits into research and development goals and supports stakeholder values, and encouraging research directions beyond ever larger language models. Uh, hi, Sotolonet, sorry, um, that's just my guess. 
Uh, I'll also say open offer if anyone is comfortable writing in the International Phonetic Alphabet. If you put your chat in the name in the International Phonetic Alphabet, I will read it first quietly in my head and then I will read it uh, out loud if it is. Um, I'm not just going to read anything you put in IPA is what I'm saying, but if you would like to correct my pronunciation of your name, that's probably the easiest way. Uh, so, if you've watched some of my other videos about like BERT and GPT-2 or 3, and we read the, the paper in the reading group, the GPT-3 paper specifically, um, you'll know that my sort of previous stance, as I've publicly stated, has been um, that a lot of these models are honestly just too big for the type of work that the developers that I support do day to day. Uh, and uh, I am looking forward to, to looking at the, the references and discussion in this paper. Um, I will say from the outside, from the outset uh, at least, um, I, I tend to agree with a lot of the points that are that are being made here. Uh, and here is the, the reference, and it's the Conference on Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, uh, which will be virtual, uh, and it's uh, ACM, which is... It's something deeply <laughs> unintuitive, like the Association of Computational Machinery or something. It's a, it's a big uh, computing conference or organization. Uh, introduction. One of the biggest trends in natural language processing has been the increasing size of language models as measured by the number of parameters and size of training data. Since 2018, alone, we have seen the emergence of BERT and its variants, a bunch of citations, GPT-2, oh, that's right, I hate the ACM citation style. Um, why do I dislike the ACM citation style? Because you can't see what the author's names are, and they are as I remember, arranged alphabetically by first author and not by... Mm -mm. Yeah, so they're arranged alphabetically by first author, so you also don't have... Um... Oh, uh, Zarek was on the um, the podcast with us in the first uh, the first episode. Uh, but it's hard to know what precise paper they are uh, citing in the text, and this paper has a lot of citations. Uh, so that... I mean, that, that's just the ACM standard and how they do their conference papers. Uh, it's just not my favorite. I like... Uh, a lot of my training was in APA, because uh, I, I work sort of adjacent to, you know, social sciences and whatnot. But that's my preference. All right, so a bunch of citations. Uh, GPT-2, uh, TNLG. I want to say that one was also out of Google. Well, this is this a hyperlink? It is a hyperlink. Uh, by Microsoft, uh, apologies, not out of Google, and uh, most recently C switch, switch C, sorry, with institutions seemingly competing to produce ever larger language models. While investigating properties of language models and how they change with size hold scientific interest, and large language models have shown improvements on various tasks, we ask whether enough thought has been given, has been put into the potential risks associated with developing them, and strategies to mitigate these risks. We first consider environmental risks. Echoing a line of recent work outlining the environmental and financial costs of deep learning systems, I, this is, uh, yeah, 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 this is uh, Emmett All's uh, paper where they, they talked about, like they went and through and calculated like the amount of, of carbon emissions um, for, for different models that were, were being presented at uh, ACL conferences. Uh, we encourage the research community to prioritize these impacts. One way this can be done is by reporting costs and evaluating works based on the amount of resources they consume. As we outline in three, increasing the environmental and financial costs of these models doubly punishes marginalized communities that are least likely to benefit from the progress achieved by large language models and more likely to be harmed by negative environmental consequences of its resource consumption. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, there's this sort of concept of environmental racism where in the U.S. as an example, um, where, you know, very polluting projects are more likely to be put in black neighborhoods because that's a group that, you know, has less political foul path, less political power and financial means. Um, so like a Cancer Alley is a really good uh, example. It's a, you know, a line of developments in um, Mississippi, I'm pretty sure, um, that's like directly over a bunch of, of uh, black communities. Yeah, it's, it's not great. Uh, at the scale we are discussing, outline two, the first consideration should be the environmental cost. Uh, and we'll, 
talk about this more in the section, but one sort of pushback that I've seen from some folks who are sort of discussing this and uh, in the in the research community is like, okay, well, but if you have one big model and everyone is using that model, can't you, um, you know, have fewer environmental impacts if you have a really big model? Um, and I think that that sounds really good in, um, in the abstract, but I also think that it's pretty clear from the current research environment that people are not taking a single model and then modifying it, but that multiple different groups are training their own very large models on the same language for the same tasks to compete on these specific benchmarks. Um, and it's very much like, I don't know, uh, It's kind of like the space race, right? If you're like, well, if we build one spaceship and everybody uses it, that's, you know, it's okay to have a bigger spaceship because more people can fit on it. But if everyone has their own spaceship, then having you having a much bigger than spaceship than you need for the thing that you're doing is uh, not actually saving materials. Um, but I'm sure we'll talk about this. Uh, and also, uh, something that I think about a lot is... Um, I, there's a, a researcher who I'm familiar with who, who works at an, an HBCU, so a historically black college and university here in the United States. Um, and uh, they do not have access to an institutional credit card due to you know, historical stuff, basically. Um, and as a result, can't use cloud computing in their research without paying for it themselves out of their own bank account. Um, and that stinks. <laughs> Like, I couldn't, well, I, I'm, you know, for, for somebody in the U.S. doing pretty well, uh, and I for sure could not pay to train one of these large bank, uh, large models out of my own, my own savings. Um, and asking people to do that is hmm, something. Anyway, so moving on, just things that I'm thinking about as this uh, uh, paper continues. Just as environmental impact scales with model size, so does the difficulty of understanding what's in the training data. In section four, we discuss how large data sets based on text from internet, the internet, sorry, uh, overrepresent hegemonic, hegemonic, yeah, like uh, being within a single organization and sharing a lot of um, values, I guess. Uh, let me Google hegemony. Uh, so that I can say what it is. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, uh, a ruling party's hegem... Uh, the social, cultural, ideological, or economic influence exerted by a dominant group. Merriam-Webster. in uh, overrepresent hegemonic viewpoints and encode biases potentially damaging to marginalized populations. In collecting ever larger data sets, we risk incurring documentation debt. We recommend mitigating these risks by budgeting for curation and documentation at the start of a project and only creating data sets large as, we ca as can be sufficiently documented. Um, also, there's a paper that just came out uh, yeah, Quirky says uh, dominant. Yeah, that's probably a better way of, of saying it than when I was sort of gesturing around. Um, there's a paper that just came out on the effect of government censorship on the language data available for certain languages online. Um, and I think that's a really good uh, piece, of, piece of evidence here, right? If all of the language data that you can get is language data that has been like specifically provided and um, curated by a specific government um, before you even see it, uh, before you even like access it as a researcher. And if, especially if you don't know that that's happening and um, th that it's going to affect your model in a certain way, it will, you know, affect the sort of um, fuzzy quote unquote knowledge that exists in your language model. Uh, as argued by Bender and Kohler, it is important to understand the limitations of language models and put their success in context. This not only helps reduce hype, which can be which can mislead the public and researchers themselves regarding the capability of these language models, but might encourage new research directions that do not necessarily depend on having langu larger language models. Uh, and this is definitely something that I've run into with developers who you know have heard about 
a particular language model and have seen like some results that look extremely good and exciting, um, but then they try to implement it or they try to get access to it and it turns out to be, you know, basically a waste of their time for their particular project that they're working on. Um, and that stings. I don't want people to waste their time. Uh, as we discussed in section five, language models are not performing natural language understanding and only have success in tasks that can be approached by manipulating linguistic form. Focusing on state-of-the-art results on leaderboards without encouraging deeper understanding of the mechanism by which they are achieved can cause misleading results as shown in citations and direct resources away from efforts that would facilitate long-term progress towards natural language understanding without using unfathomable training data. Um, so if you've been using Raza, you know that we you know, recommend using smaller data sets that you've annotated by hand for your particular project and ideally data sets that are user data of people actually using your assistant and that you've done you know your own curation for so um, i think that's definitely sort of our our stance on things is that you can't you know you can't build a really great assistant by just like shoving more random data in there that's not a good representation of what your users are trying to do furthermore well also it's not random which is another point of this uh this paper. Furthermore, the tender tendency of human interlocutors to impute meaning where there is none can mislead, mislead both NLP researchers and the general public into taking synthetic text as meaningful. Combine the ability of language models to pick up on both subtle biases and overtly abusive language patterns and training data. This leads to risks of harm, including encountering derogatory language and experiencing discrimination at the hands of others who reproduce racist, sexist, ableist, extremist, or other harm for all ideologies reinforced through interactions with synthetic media. Sorry, synthetic language. We explore these potential harms in section six and potential paths forward in section seven. We hope that a critical overview of the risks of relying on ever-increasing size of language models as the primary driver of increased performance of language technology can, <laughs> well, this is a long sentence, can facilitate a reallocation of efforts towards approaches that avoid some of the risks while still uh, reaping the benefits of improvements to language technology. So basically, if you think the only way forward in NLP is bigger language models, um, there we go. So I'm not uh, reading off the off the page. Um, you are limiting your options, perhaps unnecessarily. Background. Similar to 14, another paper, we understand the term language model to refer to systems that are trained on string prediction tasks. That is predicting the likelihood of a token, character, word, or string, given either its preceding context or in bidirectional and mask LMs, its surrounding context. Um, so historically, you'd only look at the words that come before a specific word for language modeling. Um, and uh, sort of a big change in, in NLP is uh, really doing things bidirectionally. So I'm just going to move this over until it's here, because I think that will look a little bit better. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, so, and this happened in like, I don't know, the, the mid 10s, 2010s, um, working on, on more bidirectional models. And then the mass language models, of course, came around in you know, 2016, 2017. Such systems are unsupervised and when deployed, take text as input, commonly outputting scores or string predictions. Initially proposed by Shannon in 1949, uh, Shannon of um, uh, entropy and uh, information. Uh, what's the name of the field? The only thing that comes out of my head is uh, information technology, but that's not the name of the field. It's not informatics. Anyway, uh, it's a... It's, studying the ways in which information can be encoded generally. Uh, some of the earliest implemented language models date to the early 1980s and were used as components in systems for automatic speech recognition, machine translation, document classification, and more. In this section, we provide a brief overview of the general trend of language modeling in recent years. For more in-depth survey of pre-trained language models, see this other paper. 
Before neural models, n-gram models also used large amounts of data. In addition to automatic speech recognition, these large n-gram models of English were developed in the context of machine translation from another source language with far fewer direct translation examples. For example, developed an n-gram model for English with a total of 1.8 trillion n-grams and noted steady improvements in blue score uh, on the test set of 1797 Arabic translations as the training data was increased from 13 million tokens. Um, so n-gram models also get better as you add more data. Information theory. Thank you. Uh, Y'all are heroes <laughs> to me. That's what I was looking for, um, which is uh, if you're in, in NLP or computer science and you haven't really read up much on information theory, it's uh, really helpful and I would I would recommend it. My advisor really liked information theory, <laughs> um, and he's a phonetician uh, studying speech sounds, so I think it's uh, very relevant to, it's very relevant to text, but it's sort of relevant to, you know, yeah, how communication works in general. Uh, and n-grams are, uh, n here stands for number, uh, a number of tokens, whatever your token set is, that occur next to each other, and you look at sort of statistical uh, co-occurrence of um, n. So unigrams, one word, bigram, two tokens, I sorry, I shouldn't say word, trigram, three tokens, um, skipgrams are more common where you don't look at things that are right next to each other, but that are, you know, have intervening tokens in between them. Um, and that's lots of systems still use this. Uh, it was sort of sort of the OG uh, way of, of modeling statistical patterns in, in language. The next big step was the move towards using pre-trained representations of the distribution of words, called word embeddings, in other supervised NLP tasks. These word vectors come from systems such as word to vec GloVe, and later LSTM models such as context to vec and ELMO, which I think was the first Muppet named uh, model, and supported state-of-the-art performance in question answering, textual entailment, semantic role labeling, co-reference resolution, named entity recognition, and sentiment analysis, at first in English and later for other languages as well. And this is sort of the approach that we use um, by default in your, in your config file is to, is to have this vector representation of the words. While training the word embeddings requires a relatively large amount of text, it reduced the amount of label data necessary for training on the various supervised tasks. For example, mm, showed that a model trained with ELMO reduced the necessary amount of training data needed to achieve seminal results on SRL compared to models without, as shown in one instance where a model trained with ELMO reached the maximum development F1 score in 10 epochs as opposed to 46 without ELMO. So it only had to look at all the data 10 times as opposed to 486 times. I had not heard this result. That is really exciting, actually. What paper is this? Peters et al. Knackle 2018. All right, so this is a, a little bit older. Oh, it was one of Luke's. Uh, Luke is also at... Uh... Oh, Matt. Uh, sorry, I was going to say Luke is also at University of Washington. He might actually be at AI too now. He definitely was at the, the University of Washington. Um, but folks tend to tend to move around much more in uh, in NLP than they do in... Uh, certainly in linguistics, linguists don't move around quite as much in terms of uh, research and teaching positions. Anyway, that's an exciting result. I hadn't heard that. Fun. Ah, that's not what I wanted. Go back to the paper. All right, now I have to zoom in again. Uh, I accidentally clicked on something that was link, and away we went. Uh... The model furthermore achieved the same F1 score with 1% of the data as the baseline model achieved with 10% of the training data. Increasing the number of model parameters, however, did not notice ye uh, yield noticeable increases for LSTMs. Interesting. So Elmo... I thought Elmo was a bidirectional LSTM. Don't quote me on that, but I, I feel in my gut that that's what it is, and it's not a transformer model. Interesting. Uh, transformer model, on the other hand, have been able to continuously benefit from larger architectures and larger quantities of data. Um, Devlin et al., so that's the 
that's the BERT paper, uh, in particular noted that training on large data sets and fine tuning for specific tasks led to strictly increasing results for glue tasks for English as the hyperparameters of the model were increased. So uh, a larger data set, better results, which I would say is sort of like the general um, finding in deep learning in particular, the more data you train with, the better you do on whatever your task is. Um, the training task, like the specific task that you're training your model to do. That doesn't necessarily follow that your model is going to do equally well on every task that you apply it to. <laughs> um, initially developed as Chinese language models, the Ernie family produced Ernie Gen, which was also trained on the original English BERT dataset. Uh, I vaguely remember hearing about Ernie. I don't think I've read the paper joining the ranks of very large language models. NVIDIA released the Megatron LM, which had uh, 8.3 billion parameters and was trained on 174 gigabytes of text from the English Wikipedia, Open Web Text, Real News, and CC Stories datasets. Trained on the same dataset, Microsoft released TNLG, a language model with 17 billion parameters. Um, so this is increasing both the data and the number of parameters. OpenAI GPT-3 and Google's G-Shard and Switch C have increased the definition of large language model by the orders of magnitude in terms of parameters at 175 billion, uh, 600 billion, and 1.6 trillion. Okay, so I think it is the uh, Switch C is the, the latest and biggest at the time that this paper was submitted. Table 1 summarizes a selection of these language models in terms of training data size and parameters. As increasingly large amounts of text are collected from the web in data sets such as the colossal, cre <laughs> colossal clean crawled corpus and the pile, this trend of increasingly large language models can be expected to continue as long as they correlate with an increase in performance. Um, so just to summarize, bigger models, more data, benchmark numbers go up or down accordingly to which way to write you want them to go. A number of these models also have multilingual variants, such as MBERT, multilingual BERT, uh, and this is the one that last week with the uh, Vietnamese language paper where someone was working on a, on a chatbot, um, they found that the, there just wasn't enough training data available for them to, you know, reach a good point with MBERT, um, and that uh, fast text uh, ended up being much better for their, their application. Uh, an MT5, or trained with some amount of multilingual data, such as GPT-3, where 7% of the training data was not in English. Uh, the performance, we, we talk more about that <laughs> when we read the GPT-3 paper. The performance of these multilingual models across languages is an active area of research. Wu and Dresda found that while MBERT does not perform equally well across all 104 languages in its training data, it performed better at NER, POS tagging, and dependency parsing than monolingual models trained with comparable amounts of data for, for four low resource language. So it is benefiting a little bit from multitask learning by being exposed to multiple data sets. Conversely, the surveyed mon monolingual BERT models developed with more specific architecture considerations or additional monolingual data, monolingual data and found that they generally outperform MBERT across 29 tasks. Either, anyway. Either way, these models do not address the inclusion problems uh, raised by 65, who note that over 90% of the world's languages used by more than a billion people currently have little to no uh, support in terms of language technology. That's a little ambiguous. I, I think what they're saying is that 90% of languages and those languages together are used by more than a billion people and they do not have support in terms of language technology and not that of the languages used by a billion people, 90% of those languages have no support, I think is what they're saying. Um, I'm trying to actually think what languages have a billion speakers off the top of my head. Uh, depending on your your sort of like how you're slicing it up, um, Mandarin and related languages or dialects probably do. Uh, I 
think I think English is right around the billion mark as well. Uh, let me check that. Mm -hmm. How many English speakers? Just gotta Google that. Do not know that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. List of languages by total speakers. I'm just on Wikipedia right now. Uh... Yep, the only the only languages with more than a billion speakers are uh, English and Mandarin Chinese, including uh, Standard Chinese. So uh, I think our interpretation was correct. What if you were quiet instead? That would be helpful. Okay. And alongside work, just out of just out of the the mask alongside work investigating what information the models retain from the data we see a trend in reducing the size of these models using very tes various techniques such as knowledge distillation quantization factorized embedding parameterization and cross layer parameter sharing and progressive module replacing um, and we read uh, this paper in the reading group a while ago so um, you can go watch that if you're interested uh, Quarky says, uh, I think that most languages do not have proper support for stuff like typing, etc. I would say that character sets for most languages are supported by Unicode. Fonts are a different thing. Um, the, the Unicode consortium is mostly okay at uh, adding new writing systems as needed. I, I think this is more things like, you know, tokenizers, right? Um, parsers, uh, stemmers, lemmatizers. So the sort of you know, NLP pipeline you need to turn your words into numbers in a way that's uh, useful for the thing. Uh, Quarky says, English is a bit special because more people speak English as a second language. Yes, that's true. Um, and there um, is a really interesting field of uh, linguistics that studies what's called world English, which is sort of the variety of English that's used as um, second language speakers, or I mean, often like third, fourth, fifth, sixth language speakers, um, as a, an interlingua, so a, a, or a lingua franca, a way to, not an interlingua, that's something different, uh, a way to, you know, have a shared communication language, so a lot of academic writing would fall under this, and sort of its differences from English as spoken by L1 first language speakers, like me. Um, anyway, it's interesting. Uh, Quirky says, that's software, but the hardware is very hard. Oh, you mean like straight up keyboards? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, excellent point. Yeah. So, so like typing the language in, like, is there a keyboard for, um, I'm trying to think of a, a language that has a, a unique writing system. Uh, Albanian? I think Albanian has like a fairly unique writing system and I don't know how you'd find an Albanian keyboard. Also, I don't speak Albanian. Uh, Corky says, I speak Bengali and Hindi and typing them is very hard despite Unicode support. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, yep. Especially because it's like a, I don't know about Bengali, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to say the name of this writing system wrong, but like uh, <laughs> Hindi is written with Devangari? Devangari? I do not know where the emphasis is on that. It's one of those things I mostly read. Um, and you have this sort of separation of vowels and uh, and consonants across a, a line that I'm sure has a name that I don't know the name of, but it's not like every character... I mean, I don't want to say every sound has a character because that's not how English works, but but every character is independent of the characters around it in the rest of the word. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, Rogers et al. provide a comprehensive comparison of models derived from BERT using these techniques such as Distilbert and Albert. While these models maintain and sometimes exceed the performance of the original BERT model, Despite their much smaller size, they ultimately still rely on large quantities of data and significant processing and storage capabilities, both to hold and reduce the model. Um, and that's definitely, um, especially like the amount of space that you need on a server to run like a Rosa assistant is going to have to host your whole pipeline and language model size is definitely something that folks have run into trouble with. Uh -huh. Uh, Quirky says, indic characters are a good example because characters change depending on the neighboring characters. Yeah, right. It's a 
it's not, you know, a very separated uh, writing system like, like English does. <laughs> Corky says, it has written down the word that I definitely still don't know how to say correctly. Um, but that's the, the, the writing system. Uh, Native says, please explain the threshold part and fallback actions. Uh, started replying with just the fallback action only. Um, I would run it in debug mode. Uh, the fallback action is uh, being triggered because your confidence threshold is not being met. And there's a video uh, on confidence that goes into some more details on, on the Rasa channel. It's NLP for developers. I think it's like a colon confidence. Uh, so yeah, size is definitely a consideration uh, for, you know, people who are implementing systems around these models, uh, much more than it is for a large research group that, you know, has, I mean, quite frankly, the, the money to, to rent space on servers that they need. Or their company owns the servers, also a thing. We note that the change from n-gram language models to word vectors distilled from neural language models let me redo that. We note that the change from n-gram language models to word vectors distilled from neural language models to pre-trained transformer language models is paralleled by an expansion and change in the types of tasks they are useful for. n-gram language models were initially typically deployed in selecting among the outputs of e.g. acoustical or translation models, so for, uh, for ASR. The LSTM-derived word vectors were quickly picked up as more effective representations of words in place of bag of words features in a variety of NLP tasks involving labeling and classification, and the pre-trained transformer models can be retrained on very small data sets, few-shot, one-shot, or even zero-shot learning to perform apparently meaning-manipulating tasks such as summarization, question answering, and the like. Nonetheless, all of these systems share the property of being language models in the sense as we give above, that is, system trained to predict sequences of words or characters or sentences. Where they differ is in the size of the training data sets they leverage and the spheres of influence they can possibly affect. By scaling up in these two ways, mar modern, very large language models incur new kinds of risk, which we turn to in the following section. Um, and I think that's a really good point. That's something I hadn't really thought about before. Like when n-gram language models were the thing that people were doing, the the benchmarks and uh, I mean, in those days, bake-offs, which were um, shared tasks done by the American Department of Defense, um, uh, were not focused on summarization. Uh, they were very much focused on, on other tasks. Uh, yeah, good luck, native learner. All right, environmental and financial costs. Struba et al. That's uh, Emma's paper that goes into into more details about the the carbon footprint of um, training NLP models. Uh, recently benchmarked model training and development costs in terms of dollars and estimated CO two emissions. Well, the average human is responsible for an estimated five tons CO two per year. Uh, that is skewed by people in industrialized countries like me. Uh, I would probably. I probably would not have reported the average there, but that's just me. Uh, the authors trained a transformer, big, 136, with neural architecture search. Oh, that that's gonna kill you. Uh, so neural architecture search is, it's not going to, to harm you, but that's where the majority of the work is going to be, um, because that is looking at multiple architectures and trying to find out which one works good, which means you have to train multiple models with each of the architectures. Uh, and estimated that the training procedure emitted 284 tons small t, small t, okay, okay. So big T is trillion, small t is tons uh, of CO2. Training a single BERT base model without hyperparameter tuning on GPUs was estimated to require as much energy as a trans-American flight. While some of this energy comes from renewable sources or cloud compute companies use of carbon credit offset sources, um, also this is uh, another thing that really reflects environmental racism, unfortunately. Um, Anyway, I, I don't want to get into it. It's a whole area of scholarship that I'm just sort of uh, a pretty... I, I'm, I am not deeply involved in that scholarship. I just sort of read it because I think it's good to know. Uh, the authors note that the majority of cloud compute providers' energy is not sourced from renewable sources, and many energy sources in the world are not carbon neutral. 
In addition, renewable energy sources are still costly to the environment, and data centers with increasing computation requirements take away from other potential uses of... Gosh darn it, I keep clicking that link. Oh, and this is just a... We missed this table, but it's just a, an overview of the size of things. Uh, numbers go up over time. Potential uses of green energy underscoring the need for energy efficient model architectures and training paradigms. And I don't know, I've uh, another sort of piece of discussion is that like, well, you know, one transatlantic flight is not that much carbon, all things considered, but um, if everyone's doing it right if this suddenly becomes the norm that's really going to add up and also bert on this this table that we're looking at right here uh bert's here uh and right now we are here which is several orders of magnitude up and like at no point has anyone been like all right we're all going to use roberta and we have to we don't have to trade any more la large language models and we can stop here uh the size of language models is continuing to increase over time so and it's just like it's something we should think about right like um lab researchers think about the disposal of, you know, hazardous chemicals they might use and consider that in deciding whether or not to use a specific chemical or, or do a particular, um, you know, thing. <laughs> Certainly, like, nuclear researchers think about that a lot. Um, and I think it's worth uh, NLP researchers thinking about it as well. Uh, Stubel also examines the costs of these models versus their accuracy gains. For the task of machine translation where large language models have resulted in performance gains, they estimate that an increase in 0.1 blue score using neural architecture search for German to English results in an increase of $150,000 compute cost in addition to carbon emissions. That's so much money, Jiminy Cricket. I, like, I realize this is on a corporate scale uh, and this is not like individuals paying for this, but if you are like, if you're in the situation of the, the professor at the HPCU I mentioned who, you know, this is the field you work in, this area of research is not available to you. Like it just isn't. Jiminy Cricket. To encourage more equitable access to NLP research and reduce carbon footprint, the R authors give recommendations to report training time and sensitivity to hyperparameters when the released model is meant to be retrained for downstream use. They also urge governments to invest in compute clouds to provide equitable access to researchers. I know that uh, Canada does this actually, um, that there's sort of like a Canadian cluster that you can uh, use if you're a researcher at a university there. <laughs> Quirky says, carbon credit equals pay for the privilege of not caring. That's how it feels to me anyway, but probably better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Washington State, which is where I live, is sort of considering cap and trade right now. And a lot of um, environmental justice groups are like, this is moving your problems to someone who is not rich enough to pay for them. Uh, and I think that's a good point to consider in the discussion. Uh, initiatives such as the Sustain NLP workshop, this is a great workshop, uh, have since taken up the goal of prioritizing computationally efficient hardware and algorithms. Schwartz et al. also call for the development of green AI, similar to other environmentally friendly scientific developments such as green chemistry or sustainable computing. Uh, Quirky says 150k is a a mini research group even in a European country. I'm guessing that my knee is a typo there. Um, but that's like, anyway, if you're talking about like, you could hire an engineer for a year for that type of money. Um, that's a lot to invest. Uh, yeah, so green AI considering these environmental costs. As shown in paper five, the amount of compute used to train the largest deep learning models for NLP and other applications has increased 300,000 times in six years, um, which I think is like a good, you know, addition to the point that I was making in that 
yes, if there was one large model and everyone agrees to use it, um, I guess everyone working in English, which is not everyone, um, then yes, that is perhaps overall an environmental savings, but it ke like that, that ain't the trend. We haven't stopped. Uh, is a mini research group, even in a European country. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of budget. I said you could hire an engineer or like re graduate students. <laughs> uh, speaking of, of labor exploitation, anyway. Uh, increasing at a fi far higher pace than Moore's law. To promote, to promote green AI, Schwartz et al. argue for promoting efficiency as an evaluation metric and show that most sampled papers from ACL 2018, NeurIPS 2018, and CVPR 2019, um, so this is linguistics, general deep learning, um, and then computer vision, uh, claim accuracy improvements alone as the primary contributions to the field, yep, and none focus on the measures of efficiency as primary contributions. Um, I think of I don't know when Efficient Net was published, but I think that is like a good counter example. Um, Efficient Net is, uh, uh, I believe, I don't remember where it was published, but it's a, a neural network architecture that is more efficient, and that was its main contribution. Uh, since then, works such as these ones have released online tools to help researchers benchmark their energy use. Among their recommendations are to run experiments in carbon-friendly regions, consistently report energy and carbon metrics, and consider energy performance trade-offs before deploying, deploying energy-hungry models. In addition to these calls for documentation and technical fixes, uh, Biati and uh, Vatan Parast underscore the need for social and political engagement in shaping the future where data-driven systems have minimal negative impact on the environment. Um, yeah and i like on the one hand um yes uh i think environmental implications are deeply important to the you know future of our survival as a species uh but also in the very near term just thinking about you know i always have sort of a more developer who's trying to deploy something mindset because that's what i work with um if it's too expensive, it's not going to happen, right? Like things should be, cost is a major consideration and not just for, you know, researchers from small research groups, but for like the people who are trying to put these, these systems into production. And if you're, I mean, I think basic research definitely has its place, but if your justification for research is that this is going to help improve commercial applications and people cannot use your system in commercial applications because it is too large, um, did, did you do the thing you wanted to do? Like, maybe not. Uh, uh, TYOC says less parameters than a ResNet, but equal on tasks. So it seems, uh, and that was, that was efficient. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that I, I will, I will say I am not very deep in the computer vision literature, but my impression is that that did not spark a revolution of everybody getting really excited about smaller models, unfortunately. Well, benchmarks, uh, well, paper, benchmarks the training process in a research setting. Many language models are deployed in industrial or others. Oh, they're going to say exactly what I was saying. In industrial or other settings where the cost of inference might greatly outweigh that of training in the long run. In this scenario, it may be more appropriate to deploy models with lower energy costs during inference, even if their training costs are high. Uh, in addition to benchmarking tools, works estimating the cost increase associated with the introduction of language models for particular applications and how they compare to alternative NLP methods will be important for understanding the trade-offs, definitely. When we perform risk-benefit analyses of language technology, we must keep in mind how the risks and benefits are distributed because they do not accrue to the same people. On the one hand, it is well documented in the literature on environmental racism, yes, yeah, what I mentioned earlier, that the negative effects of climate change are reaching and impacting the world's most marginalized communities first, um, particularly Pacific Islanders. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, that's that's the uh, community that comes to, communities, there's multiples, uh, that comes to mind first, but also like thinking about uh, the, the awful, uh, like drought, uh, and, um, associated, you know, I'm thinking about locusts, uh, all through the, uh, the sort of the, the Near East right now. Uh, it is fair 
Is it fair or just to ask, for example, that the residents of the Maldives, likely to be underwater by 2100, or 80,000 people in Sudan affected, where are we on the page, by drastic floods, pay the environmental price of training and deploying ever larger lang English language models when similar large scale uh, language models aren't being produced for uh, Divehi? Uh, I'm guessing that this is like a this age is an aspiration thing. I don't know for sure. I am not super familiar with this language, which I am assuming is uh, spoken in the Maldives. Maldives? 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 This is an excellent example of how I can't know, uh, or how I don't know what is important to uh, every community. Uh, or Sudanese Arabic. And while some language technology is genuinely designed to benefit marginalized communities, most language technology is built to serve the, the needs of those who already have the most privilege in society. Um, and this is, you know, something that I talk about a lot is that if most people don't speak English like I do, it's good for me, but if I build something or I have an approach that only works in English, I can't help everybody, and I'm really prioritizing the needs of people like me who, quite frankly, have had uh, a lot of helping themselves to stuff that wasn't there, Histo this area historically. Uh, uh, consider, for example, who is likely to have both the financial resources to purchase a Google Home, Amazon Alexa, or an Apple device with Siri installed and comfortably speak a variety of a language which they are prepared to handle. Furthermore, when large language models encode and reinforce hegemonic, 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 hegemonic uh, biases, see section four and six, the harms that follow are most likely to fall on marginalized populations who, even in rich nations, are most likely to experience environmental racism. Um, Cancer Alley, what I what I mentioned earlier, which I, I'm pretty sure it's in Mississippi. These models are being developed at a time when unprecedented environmental changes are being witnessed around the world. Um, I live in a state that was extremely on fire last year and is probably going to be very on fire again this year. For monsoons uh, caused by changes in rainfall patterns due to climate change affecting more than 8 million people in India, to the worst fired season in record, uh, on record in Australia, killing or displacing nearly 3 billion animals and at least 400 people, the effect of climate change continues to set new records every year. It is past time for researchers to prioritize energy efficiency and cost to reduce negative environmental impacts and inequitable uh, access to resources, both of which disproportionately affect people who are already in marginalized positions. So that is the, the section on uh, environmental impact and training cost. All right, let's see, we're on page four of... And it looks like the last four pages are all citations. Uh, that is an incredible amount of citations for an ACM paper, I should say. Usually you get like half a page of citations in an ACM conference. Um, yeah, let's start in the next section. Just gonna check the time. Yeah, we got time. Let's, let's start in the next section. Unfathomable training data. Uh, the size of data available on the web has enabled deep learning models to achieve high accuracy on specific benchmarks in NLP and computer vision applications. However, in both application areas, the training data has been shown to have problematic characteristics, resulting in models that encode stereotypical and derogatory associations along gender, race, ethnicity, and disability status. In this section, we discuss how large, uncurated, internet-based data sets encode the dominant he hegemon hegemonic? The dominant dominant view, uh, which further harms people at the margins and recommends significant resource allocation towards data set curation and documentation practices. Um, also, just like an, a side note, um, I so there's been a lot of discussion recently around um, people's uh, photos being used without their knowledge or consent in facial recognition data sets. Um, and available on the web, I think does not, and this is a separate discussion, but does not immediately correlate to, and also I should be able to use it for whatever I want, right? Um, in terms of in terms of machine learning. Uh, and I, I think it's, I don't wanna to speak to the legality, it's clearly an ongoing problem, not problem, it's, on, it's clearly an ongoing discussion, um, but yeah, just something I've, I have been thinking about quite a lot recently. 
<laughs> Quirky says it's a tough word. Yeah. Uh, I was also one of those kids that, despite having some difficulty with reading, read a lot and did not necessarily say, say the words that I read. Uh, and I was in my teens before I learned that pneumonia and pneumonia were actually the same thing <laughs> and you didn't say the P. Um, so that's that's a little background on, on me. Uh, however, in both application areas, the training data has been shown to have problematic characteristics, citations, resulting in models that encode stereotypical and derogatory associations along gender, race, ethnicity, and disability status. Um, and I will also say these are sort of the, the ones that are most studied, certainly in the United States. These are the, the, the groups for which, you know, there is a lot going on socially. Um, but I, I don't know that it is obvious the groups that are important um, in a specific location are not going to be universal, right? Um, uh, just an example, like we don't have caste in the US, um, which is very much a thing in India and would be relevant in, in anything you, you worked on with, you know, language from India uh, that would not necessarily be super relevant in the US. Although I guess there's a lot of folks from India here, so maybe it's becoming more relevant. Um, or like there's so many things that, like I just don't know what groups are socially relevant because I'm not in that society. Um, but because, you know, we do research on things that we know about, um, I think this is going to be a, a pretty American focus paper. Um, and I just want to mention that. Uh, in this section, we discuss how large uncurated internet based data sets encode the dominant <laughs> hegemonic. I'm just going to go with hegemonic, that's what it is, like hedgehog, uh, view, which further harms people at the margins and recommends significant resource allocation towards data set curation and documentation practices. Uh, section 4.1. Thighs. Uh, there is a, uh, a footnote here. Uh, we don't do intend to erase existing work on low resource languages. One particularly exciting uh, example is the Masakan project, which explores participatory research techniques for developing machine translation for African languages. There's a lot of NLP going on um, in Africa, uh, which is, is very excited. I, I follow a bunch of people on Twitter and whenever like a new thing comes out, I'm like, oh, exciting. Uh, Africa is extremely linguistically diverse. Um, which is a part of the reason why it is hard to do NLP work. Uh, these promising directions do not involve amassing terabytes of data. All right, section 4.1. Size doesn't guarantee diversity. The internet is a very large and diverse virtual space, and accordingly, it is easy to imagine that very large data sets, such as Chrome and Crawl, petabytes of data collected over eight years of web crawling, a filtered version of which is included in the GPT-3 training data, must therefore be broadly representative of the ways in which different people view the world. Also, I don't know if they're going to talk about this, um, but filtered version and how the version is doing can actually like pretty dramatically change uh, what groups are represented and what information is represented. So there was a um, it might actually have been with the the C switch uh, language model they mentioned, but there was there's a language model recently. Um, I want to say it was out of Google where they they released their code, and part of the code was the filtering that they'd done on the the data that they'd collected. And one of the words that they'd removed, where they removed like documents or or strings or whatever, um, with the word sex in them. Um, and the big problem there is that, of course, you would remove any people talking about their sexual orientation or um, a lot of, you know, discussions around that or a lot of medical texts. So uh, if you're just doing like, hey, look for these keywords and get rid of them, you may get rid of information you do want to get rid of. Uh, but it, you're going to also really change the representation of uh, text diversity that you have in your in your data set. Um, and we talk about that uh, with uh, Zreek and a oh, third person who was on the podcast in the very first podcast episode about abusive language. And her name is not in the oatmeal today. It was, uh, this is the oatmeal. My brain is the oatmeal. Um, No, it isn't. Uh, but the, the very first podcast episode, we talked a lot about why you can't just use a list of keywords. Anyway, filtering. However, on closer examination, we find that there are several factors which narrow internet participation, the...
discussions, which will be included via the crawling methodology, and finally, the texts likely to be contained after the crawled data are filtered. Um, so a great example for, for me for um, participation in, in internet discussions and producing text on the internet. Um, I didn't have internet access or reliable internet access until I went to college. Um, and that was like the first time that I could like post things on the internet because we were in, uh, you know, on a farm. We had extremely limited bandwidth for the internet. Um, and we, it was needed for doing, you know, the farm work and, um, you know, you know, office work for, for that stuff. So like we didn't, like I couldn't just Google something, right? Until I was uh, a freshman in college. So uh, yeah, young Rachel's thoughts are not on the internet. Uh, Quirky says, it's a catch-22. Ideally filtering should be as smart as the final model to be any good. Right now filtering is very basic with no concept of context. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, and I think, I mean, this is not going to be a popular thing for me to say, uh, but my my stance at the moment is you shouldn't use as sort of like the core data of your model any data set that's too big for you to do human annotation on. And it doesn't have to be like one person, obviously. Uh, like the, the reason Raza X is set up the way it is is so that teams can work together on these on these uh, virtual assistants and improve them over time and do the data annotation. Um, you know, collectively as part of the development process. But if you're building a machine learning NLP project, uh, the data that you use is as important as the code. And yeah, I, I you gotta look at it. That's that's my stance on it. You just gotta look at it. Uh, Quirky says, I didn't have reliable access to the internet even at university. Yeah, that's a good point. Like I went to a, you know, a uh, university in a wealthy industrialized country. Um, we had internet access in the dorms that we didn't have to pay extra for. Uh, we had like campus-wide Wi-Fi and that is not true of everybody. Yeah, anyway, uh, just ways in which people don't have internet access that we would assume they do. Uh, Tim Daniel says internet connectivity is a huge problem in the US. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It's a big, 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 big geographic area. Um, and there's not not great access in a lot of places. Uh, in all cases, the voices of people most likely to hew to a hegemonic viewpoint are also the most likely to be maintained. In the cases of US and UK English, this means that white supremacist and misogynistic, ageist, etc. views are overrepresented in the training data, not only exceeding the prevalence in the general population, but also setting up models trained on these data sets to further amplify biases and harms. Starting with who is contributing to the internet text collections, we see that internet access itself is not evenly distributed, resulting in internet data overrepresenting younger users and those from developed countries. Uh, and I would say, you know, urban users and uh yeah uh bolshevik power says are you coding and whining oh no this is electrolyte water <laughs> um and this i don't have coffee today i actually have tea so I'm trying to stay hydrated uh the reading group in particular is very rough on my voice uh so i need to make sure i have plenty of liquid going in um, yeah, and we're reading the paper on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Can language models be too big about language models? We'll be coding tomorrow. I shall say it is 10 a.m. in the morning for me, so it would be very early. Uh, however, it's not just the internet as a whole that is in question, but rather specific subsamples of it. For example, uh, GPT-2's training data is sourced by scraping outbound links from Reddit, and Pew Internet Research's 2016 survey reveals that 67% of Reddit users in the United States are men, and 64% are between the ages of 6, 18 and 29, which is not a representative sample of even people in the United States. Similarly, recent surveys of Wikipedians found that only 8.8 to 15% are women or girls. Um, and I would also say, before... I don't remember what year it is, but depending on when the, the data was taken from Reddit, um, they used to have uh, extremely, um, basically like no site wide moderation policy about like, you can't be a white supremacist. So a lot of the data like in earlier Reddit corpora in particular is uh, 
bad. I mean, like, it is data that exists and it is pe things that people said, but a lot of it contains, you know, abusive, toxic language. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, heard Vienna somewhere. No, I, we might have talked about Vienna, but uh, I am I am in Washington State. Furthermore, while well, user-generated content sites like Reddit, Twitter, and Wikipedia present themselves as open and accessible to anyone, there are structural factors, including moderation practices, which make them less welcome to marginalized populations. Um, and also, like I, I mentioned, like uh, internet access, uh, which I think we've seen, you know, a lot this year with different uh, um, countries undergoing political turmoil, having, you know, countrywide access to the internet being restricted. Um, I might have been last year that, like, Ethiopia lost internet access. I would say Uganda did as well. Um, pretty sure Myanmar did, like, this week. Um, so even just like that's internet wide access, but then also um, censorship of like specific sites. Like uh, I think like Twitter is not accessible in China, for example. I don't know that for sure. Um, moderation policies, which make them less welcome to marginalized populations. Jones documents using digital ethnography techniques, multiple cases where people on the receiving end of death threats on Twitter have had their accounts suspended while the accounts issuing the death threats persist. I have seen this happen as well. She further reports that harassment on Twitter is experienced by a wide range of overlapping groups, including domestic abuse victims, sex workers, trans people, queer people, immigrants, medical patients by their providers, yikes, neurodivergent people, and visibly or vocally disabled people. Um, and I mean, just to be very honest, I have personally received harassment on Twitter as well. Uh... Corky says, it's outbound ranks from Reddit, so the quality of conversation is not a direct concern, but indirectly is probably a factor. Um, yeah, and I mean, topic selection is also not. Like, I don't know that they were filtering for, for example, links pointing to the websites of, um, you know, white nationalist groups that might have, again, straight up hate speech on them. Uh, uh, Pafera says, quick off top question is the tutorial on how to install a spacey model for chatbot to actually change the config.yaml if I want to use spacey. Um, I don't know if it's, so spacey just underwent a major version update to spacey 3.0. Um, and I know that it is an area of active work to get Raza working with Spacey 3.0, so that could be part of your um, uh, your problems if you have if you have that version of Spacey and then two point what are we on two point two point one of Ra two point two two point two of Raza I think is our most recent version, um, so that could potentially be the the issue. Um, I would check the the Raza docs for for Spacey stuff. Uh, the net result is that a limited set of subpopulations can continue to easily add data, share their thoughts, and develop platforms that are inclusive of their wor worldviews. This systemic pattern, in turn, worsens diversity and inclusion within internet-based communication, creating a feedback loop that lessens the impact of data from underrepresented populations. So, yeah, I'm just going to see how much we have left in this one section. Yeah, I think I'm going to uh, uh, finish up this section and then and then call it a day. Even if populations who feel unwelcome in mainstream sites set up different fora for communication, plural forum, uh, they may be less likely to be included in the training data for language models. Take, for example, older adults in the US and UK. Lazar et al outline how both individually and collectively articulate uh, outline how they both individually and collectively articulate anti-ageist frames specifically through blogging while some other adults prefer which some over okay so they're talking about anti-ageism stuff on blogs which some older adults prefer over more popular social media sites for discussing sensitive topics which i think makes sense you can get a chance to do a lot more of um a lot more discussion, a lot more nuance. 
Uh, these four I contain rich discussions about what constitutes age discrimination and the impacts thereof. However, a blogging community such as the one described by Lazar et al. is less likely to be found than other blogs that have more incoming and outgoing links. Um, also another um, sort, of, sort of talking about it, something similar that I have noticed is that um, when it comes to sharing information about cooking and recipes, there is uh, sort of a, I don't know that it's generational, but definitely uh, older chefs or home chefs, home cooks tend to use forums and uh, sort of like recipe compilation sites and younger chefs are more likely to use blogs. Uh, so there's like another example of, uh, I think we'd call that eight. Well, no, it's not linguistic change. So I don't know that it's age grading, but like age communities being in, uh, in different places on the internet. Finally, the current practice, oh, they're talking about it. Uh, the current practice of filtering data sets can further articulate, attenuate, excuse me, so weaken the voices of people from marginalized identity. The training set for GPT-3 was a filtered version of the common call data set developed by training a classifier to pick out those documents. Most similar to the ones used in GPT-2's training data, i.e. documents linked to from Reddit, plus Wikipedia and a collection of books. Well, this was reportedly if that's not actually centered. There we go. Well, this was reportedly effective at filtering out documents that previously previous works characterized as unintelligible. That's a label. That's a label. Wow. Uh, which is unmeasured and thus unknown is what else it filtered out. Uh, sorry. So there are definitely like perfectly reasonable types of language use that I wouldn't be able to understand because I am not in that community uh, and. Yeah, that's a, that is a choice. Uh, the colossal clean crawled corpus used to train a trillion parameter uh, LM in 43, I think that's um, uh, switch C, uh, is cleaned inter alia by discarding any page containing one of a list of about 400 dirty, naughty, obscene, or otherwise bad words. Yeah, all right. Uh, this list is overwhelmingly words related to sex with a handful of racial slurs and words direct related to white supremacy, e.g. swastika, white power included. While possibly effective at removing documents containing pornography and the associated problematic stereotypes encoded in the language of such sites and certain types of hate speech, this approach will also undoubtedly attenuate by suppressing such words as twink, the influence of online spaces built for by and for LGBTQ people. Uh, so twink is a term referred to um, a certain type of, of gay man, usually younger, thinner, um, as opposed to something like a, I don't want to get this too, too into this, but this is a word that would be used in the, in the LGBT community. G underlined in that case. If we filter out the discourse of marginalized populations, we fail to provide training data that reclaims slurs and otherwise describes marginalized identities in a positive light. Thus, at each step from initial participation in internet fora to continued presence there, to the collection and finally filtering of training data, current practice privileges the hegemonic view point. Um, yeah, and this is something I think about a lot, like, a lot of my friends who are from different minorities and, um, you know, work in tech, whether that be, I mean, non-men non are definitely a minority in tech, or who are from the LGBTQ community population, or who are not white, um, have either left, you know, public forums of communication like Twitter, or have made their accounts private, which would mean they wouldn't be included in something like this. Um, and that's, you know, it's just a very, very common pattern that people get harassed off of platforms uh, and that happening at a large scale is going to affect the the training data you have access to. This is a really, really good point. It's actually something that I haven't um, thought about a whole bunch before, but it definitely makes sense. Uh, in accepting large amounts of web text as quote, representative, representative of all of humanity, we risk perpetuating dominant viewpoints, increasing power imbalances, and further reifying inequality. We instead propose practices that actively seek to include communities underrepresented on the internet. For example, one can take inspiration from movements to decolonize education by moving towards oral histories due to the overrepresentation of colonial views in text and curate training data sets through a thoughtful process of deciding what to put in rather than aiming solely for scale and trying haphazardly to wheeze out post hoc flotsam 
to weed out post hoc flotsam deemed dangerous, unintelligible, or otherwise bad. Um, yeah, that's something I'm thinking about. I think a lot about, particularly in terms of like data cleaning, right? So the process of data cleaning is you have a large set of pieces of information, um, and you also have an idea of what you want to be in that set of pieces of information, and what you're choosing to include and choosing to discard will make a really big difference to the model that is trained using that, that information. Uh, yeah. Yeah, interesting uh, point about the, the oral histories as well. So for a lot of, um, uh, you know, languages of the Americas that are not here because of uh, colonialization, uh, many of the, the corpora that are available are transcriptions of, you know, oral histories or, or stories that have been shared and that's sort of like what you have um, for, for that specific language. So, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Uh, so I think I'm going to call that there for this week. Next week, we will not be having live streaming at all Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because it is the Raza Summit, uh, which let me pull it up and then readjust so y'all can see. Uh, I'm very excited for I have a talk. It's actually gonna be the very, very last talk of the summit. Let me scooch this in. Nope, not from that direction. Why is it anchored over there? I wonder. I wonder if that's something I can change. Anyway, uh, so here we go. Here is the Raza Summit uh, and information on it. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. We got a lot of really cool speakers. Um, uh, a lot of us from Raza, of course, but like also just a bunch of different folks who have, um, you know, different areas of uh, experience. Will I think actually Will just became a Raza hero or I think we'll just become a Razi hero. Um, so lots of our most active community members, people who are working on, you know, building different assistants, uh, who have different types of experience. Um, and yeah, it should be a really good time. So if you're interested, uh, Raza.com slash summit. Oh, one sec. I think we have a, uh, a code as well. Let me see if I can get that super quick and share that in the chat uh, to help you out with uh, getting a ticket. Uh, and this is a, a code for community members, which includes y'all. Uh, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, so no uh, no live streaming next week, so we will pick up with this, not next week, but the week after. I know it's in here somewhere. In the chat. Oh, well, dang, I can't see it. I do want to put it in the chat while the video is still live. Uh, yeah, so, so far we've read about half the paper. Uh, we've talked about the economic impacts of, uh, or the, the environmental and economic impacts of these uh, large models. We've talked about how the data in the model is not going to be necessarily a good representation of uh, the distribution of people in the population. Uh, which, I mean, hopefully, you know, if you're building a product, you want everybody to use it. You want it to be good and accessible and enjoyable to use. Um, so that's uh, that's a problem. I'll post it in the in the uh, comments of the video rather than than in the in the chat because I can't find the link right now. But yeah, so we will be back tomorrow with live coding. We'll be working on making our uh, little example assistant that we've been working on um, more. Uh, powerful in terms of querying our database. Um, so being able to do multi-field queries, basically. And yeah, and then it'll be the summit. So hope to see you there. Hope to see you at the live coding tomorrow. Um, otherwise, I will see you the week after next. All right. Have a great day.